Um, well, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. How many of you were at the biohacking conference in Orlando just recently? Did you catch my presentation happen to be at that time? No? Okay, well, one, one or two. Great, thank you so much. Um, we did talk a lot about hair loss and hair restoration, and obviously that's been my full-time career for over 25 years. I am the founder and medical director of Bauman Medical, which is a 12,000 square foot facility that's been around uh, since the 1990s in Boca Raton, Florida. Just a, a little drive up the block. If you'd like to come and see the, the space, you're certainly welcome to. But it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. We're going to talk about, of course, biohacking baldness. Everybody wants to look good and feel good, and hair is a big part of that today. One of the most common questions I get is how I got started in the field of hair loss and hair restoration. Everybody wants to know that. It's one of the most common things that uh, I hear from folks either at the booth or on the street, actually. Most people have never met a full-time board-certified hair restoration physician, so they want to know, how did I get started at that about 25 years ago? And I will tell you, I was thinking about plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. I was in my general surgery internship and residency at that time, but I wasn't thinking anything about hair except that I liked my hair, I had a ponytail, and my dad was totally bald. So that was kind of the beginning of my thoughts on hair. But I met a patient who had had a hair transplant, and I was unable to tell that he had had the work done. And I was fascinated by his description of the procedure, the undetectable hairline at a time like 25 years ago when things were mostly pluggy and probably pretty painful and such, and painful to look at, usually. But what, he saw, what I saw in him was amazing, and what he told me about how, he changed, how it changed his life was amazing. And I remember him telling me about how it changed his career, it changed him socially, professionally, and so forth, and that always stuck with me. And I figured, man, I should look into this. And, uh, you know, the long story short is that I became a board-certified hair restoration physician. So um, we're going to move into that. Or if you would like to know a little bit more about my background and my training and my certifications and awards and such, please just go visit the website at baumanmedical.com. This is my office in Boca Raton, Florida. It's an amazing 12,000 square foot facility and we do a lot, not just hair transplantation obviously, but what I'm going to teach you about and tell you about today, hair loss management, trying to keep the hair that you have, really critically important. We're going to talk today about, of course, transplantation. What we're doing is education. I'm a big advocate for scalp health and scalp hygiene. I actually have an entire department dedicated to that at the practice. Um, we do a lot of research and consulting for our in house uh, treatments and procedures, as well as for the industry at large. And one of the other things that we do is for people who cannot undergo hair transplantation, we offer non-surgical hair replacement cranial prosthetic devices. And so that's a big part of what we do as well for uh, cancer and chemo patients and autoimmune alopecias. So as we get started today, there are a few different goals and objectives. One of the things I'm going to do is give you a ton of information and a big overview about what we do, but I would hope that maybe you would just promise me before we get started going over all of this, that if you have a hair loss concern, or maybe you know someone whose quality of life is affected by their hair or hair situation, that you take this information and share it with them and say, hey, I saw Dr. Bauman at the biohacking conference, and so how many of you will promise to do that? All right, awesome. So we'll talk about hair and self-image, the physiology of the hair follicle. We'll talk about the pathophysiology of hair loss, how hair loss happens and what we can do about it. And of course, the key steps to biohacking your hair, um, as well as Dave Asprey's most famous hair upgrade procedure, which I performed for him last year. Anybody heard of that guy? Um, and the future, of course, hair cloning and such. So hair loss has been a big problem for a long time and people realize that hair is a sign of age and youth. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Dave came to me. If you're going to live to 180, he wants to do it with a full head of hair. And so I had the chance, most people didn't know that he was totally bald on the top of his head because he's like superhumanly tall. He's like eight feet tall. But we did some transplanting back there and of course his hairline, you could see it if you've been watching his Instagram feed. Um, the first time I got a chance to see it in person actually after the transplant was in person in Orlando. There's a video about his experience, which is not going to be played today. I can show it to you at the booth if you'd like later on, or you can search it up on my website. So biohacking hair obviously goes hand in hand with biohacking just about anything else. So it's do-it-yourself biology. What can you do on your own to help the hair growth? 
It, we talk a lot about tracking and measurements. At the booth, we have the a first AI microscope, which is artificially intelligent powered, counting the hairs on your head. So all of your hair, maybe somebody's heard the phrase, all of the hairs on your head are numbered. Well, I've got the tool to check it out and count them. Um, we'll talk about trichogenomics, which is the use of DNA testing to figure out what treatments or procedures you might be a, uh, responsive to when it comes to hair therapies. And we'll talk about personalized precision care, how that relates to what medications or other therapies we might use for you. And if you haven't had a chance to hear the, uh, the interview with Dave, then obviously it's 727, you can check that out. So hair loss is a big problem. About 100 million Americans out there are dealing with the situation. A little bit more men than women in my practice. It's about 50-50, but it, it occurs very, very often. In men, 20% of men have a visible hair thinning problem, and by age 50, 50% of men are gonna have some visible hair loss, and the same numbers hold true. About 50% of women 50 and over have some hair thinning or other hair problem. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a long-standing problem. I got this, uh, this is a wall post from Facebook from way back when, and you can see it's, you know, she's still liking him, and he, but even though he's got a little bald spot there, obviously beauty and youth is what hair is all about. And a friend of mine said fertility. So what does that mean? Making you a good match, a good mate to propagate the species. But when hair loss occurs, it's not a good situation. You've heard of the bad hair day. Well, hair loss can turn into a bad hair life, and that's not so good. Um, you can have a feeling of low self-esteem. It affects your quality of life. You start searching for answers, solutions. You can start panic shopping, uh, going around town, getting blood tests here and there, and you can really delay a lot of time, unfortunately. A lot of young men will opt for the the, the baseball cap to try to cover it. And no, baseball caps don't cause hair loss. But if you hide your hair loss under a baseball cap, by the time you take that thing off 10 years down the road, wow, a lot of hair loss is gone. A lot of hair loss has occurred. A lot of hair is gone. And so um, what we want to do is try to avoid that, get the treatments going sooner rather than later, because time is follicles, as we say in the field of hair loss. So I'm going to introduce you to the coolest organ in the body. And no, it's not the one below the belt. This is the one that's on your head. This is the pilosebaceous unit. This is the hair follicle. It contains nerve endings, arteries, blood vessels. It's reactive to hormones. It's reactive to um, endocrine and paracrine signals. It's got its own smooth muscle. It, it you know, lifts up when you have an exciting time or if you're chilly in the, in the cold. Um, the, what we call the niche, if you will, of the hair follicle includes the hair follicle itself and the stuff around it, which includes the adipocytes and fibroblasts, which are in that local zone. And there's a clock, a biologic clock, that turns the hair follicle on and off. And this is all regulated by um, a stem cell niche, which I'll show you in a few moments. Now, this is what a hair follicle looks like under the skin. Um, we don't take this kind of skin from the scalp anymore, but this was a, a good way to show you the anatomy. It's about five millimeters deep and less than a millimeter wide, and you've got about 150,000 of these on your scalp. And your body uses a lot of energy to make hair. And maybe that's why it's so mm, metabolically, maybe it's so important uh, in terms of our youth, in terms of our health, because it, it requires so much energy and activity to actually make it work. So uh, we're talking about 50,000 inches per month of hair from one, uh, from one person. And that would be about six feet of hair per hour, if, you, if I did my math correct. And so I always say it's a highly accessible dermal appendage, which is a neuromas neuromuscular, vascular, and endocrine mini, mini organ containing a stem cell niche that creates a quite enormous emotional effect, not only in the person that owns all of those hair follicles, but usually an observer as well. Um, this is a YouTube video, which you will not see today, but basically what it does is it would have described how active your hair follicles are, turning on and turning off. Sometimes our hair looks kind of static and limp, but the hair follicles under the scalp are always in some state of either resting and relaxation or they're actively producing a hair fiber. And these hair fibers are turning on, these follicles are turning on and turning off over time through the phases of antigen, catagen, and telogen. And so normal antigen usually takes about three to seven years. That's the length of hair production. And then the follicle will turn off for about 90 days and then kick in again. And when the hair follicle kicks in and produces another hair, you get a shed. 
So some shedding every day is normal. The bald head doesn't shed, but a healthy hair does. So about 100 to 200 hairs per day is actually quite normal. So here's the, the control center of the hair follicle, right near where the erector pili muscle attaches. That's where the stem cell bulge is. And it's the master control area for the activity that goes on at the dermal papilla. And the dermal papilla is where all the proliferating progenitor cells are going to be making the cells that eventually end up, most of them end up in the hair fiber. And so there's a lot of crosstalk between this, the bulge in this, where the stem cells are and the dermal papilla, turning this system on and off over time. And so if you're going to hack the system like a good biohacker would, you'd want to know what are those messages. And so there's been a lot of research over time. I'm not going to dwell on some of these growth factors, but just so you know, these growth factors appear and disappear, and that's part of the control mechanism to turn the follicle on and turn the follicle off. There's also messages that come not just from the bulge and the dermal papilla, but also from the local dermal fibroblasts and the adipocytes, um, which may uh, be helpful to understand why things like stem cell therapy using your own fat could potentially help grow hair on your scalp. And we've done that in the practice over many years, although the technology and the regulations have changed on that a bit. So here's your list of growth factors. There'll be a quiz at the end to see if you remember them. Um, hair loss in men. 98% of all hair loss in men is androgenetic alopecia. And so what is that? That is male pattern baldness. That's what you get from the mom's side or the dad's side. It's the receding hairline, it happens here first, and then you get the balding in the crown and eventually end up looking like my dad. Uh, but it can happen early. You can get young guys in their 20s and such who have thinning and balding going on. Sometimes I have patients that come in immediately even during high school where they have a thinning patch going on in their crown area and we've got to take aggressive action. But what causes this male pattern hair loss? Well, it's a genetic sensitivity to your body's androgens. Androgens are the male hormones, specifically DHT, dihydrotestosterone. You guys have heard of DHT. It's responsible for increasing your prostate size but also miniaturizing the hair follicles. And if you continue to expose a follicle that's sensitive to DHT, this arrow, notice it only goes in one direction. It only gets worse with time without treatment. In women, I can tell you, having been married for 23 years, it's always a little bit more complicated. So um, multiple factors affect hair growth and hair loss in women. You can see this list. Genetics, medications, illness, diet, stress, nutrition. Um, there are a lot of things. Women's hair follicles are typically just more sensitive in general. But female pattern hair loss looks different. You don't see the balding pattern. It happens diffusely behind the hairline most of the time, which sometimes you can see a little bit of a recession. But women will come in, they'll say their ponytail is shrinking, their volume is shrinking, maybe they have less coverage, maybe they have a receding hairline. If you're on hormone replacement therapy, it can be worse, faster. Uh, telogen effluvium is an excessive shedding. It, that can happen at the time of an illness like a fever or flu, a COVID, a vaccine, can also trigger a shedding phase. Childbirth, menopause also can trigger shedding. Sometimes this can become chronic. You go through a, a series of shedding phases, whether it be monthly or annually. Female pattern hair loss, like I said, looks different, and that's the point of this slide right here. In terms of what you see with the naked eye, you can keep coverage of the scalp with 50% of your hair missing. So by the time a woman notices that she's starting to have a widening part line, our data, our science shows in the clinical literature that she's already 50% gone in that area in terms of hair density. And that's not so good. So again, another reason to start early and be proactive. Other types of alopecia are beyond the scope of this presentation, but we're seeing um, a lot of scarring alopecias caused by nanoparticles like sunscreen, and we see that often in our female patients. It's called frontal fibrosing alopecia. If you have a deep receding hairline in a woman, we want to rule out these other types of alopecias, and it's really important to get a board-certified hair restoration physician involved, because you don't want to be thinking that you have female pattern hair loss when you actually have a scarring alopecia. So there, that's another good reason to find a doctor out there. So this is what the follicles, uh, the, sorry, the hair scalp looks like under the microscope. Can't see the follicles in this photo because they're under the skin. But when the follicles miniaturize, you get a weaker, thinner, wispier hair over time. And you get 
weaker coverage. And so these kinds of photos, like this one and this one, are done under about 80 times magnification, and these photos are about 40 to 50 times magnification. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of reasons why the hair loss can occur and these follicles weaken. The insults specifically to the hair and the scalp, there's extrinsic or environmental factors, things that come from the outside of our body that can affect the hair follicle. Toxins, pollution, styling products, UV exposure, everything that's happening up here at the level of the skin seeps down in. Even though our skin is designed to protect us from the outside, it doesn't always happen. So what happens? You get this, um, this, these exposure to these effects and you get oxidative stress, catagen, and apoptosis, which is essentially cell death. So it can really diminish and degrade the hair follicle. People say, well, what about these chemicals and heat that I'm using to style? Well, in moderation it may be okay, but overdone, you can really damage the skin and the hair. Mechanical and traction is another extrinsic factor. You can see tight braids in some populations which cause hair loss. Obviously, if you continue to pluck a hair, like that's a, there's a psychological condition called trichotillomania, causes hair loss. Or if you're wearing extensions over a period of time, many, many years, extending, gluing, whatever attachment method, you can cause hair loss in those areas too. So mechanical and traction is not good on the hair follicle. What are the intrinsic or internal factors that disrupt the hair follicle cycling? And again, the reason why you want to know this is so that you can hack the system, reduce your risk factors, which we'll get to. But stress and cortisol disrupts this whole situation. Hormone fluctuations, genetics and aging, nutritional deficiencies, poor circulation to the hair follicle. There's a lot of reasons why you can choke off the way that the hair follicle is supposed to be working. Inflammation can lead to fibrosis. This is a big problem with chronic inflammation of the scalp. So if your scalp is trying to tell you something, it's itchy, flaky, oily, whatever, if it hurts, then there's inflammation there. We want to cool that inflammation down because the inflammation, we know, absolutely disrupts the hair follicle cycling. So what do we do about this? How do we, someone comes into the office, what do we do for diagnosis and evaluation? Well, personalized precision medicine approach today includes not just a history and physical exam but it includes a dna analysis so you do a cheek swab take the dna fill out a form that's epigenetic right so that's talking about your lifestyle factors that gets sent off to the laboratory and we're looking at different pathways of hair loss progression and also potential treatment modality categories and so this is a pretty exciting new area of medicine, pharmacogenetics, taking the DNA and figuring out what you're likely to respond to. I'm sure everybody's heard the story, well, I tried blah, 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 Rogaine, and it didn't work. Well, this can answer why, because what we do is when you get, do that test, there's some techno-wizardry that goes on, and then you get this report about 16 different SNPs, three different variations, which means 48 different potential outcomes from each, uh, on each report. It's pretty exciting. Um, biohacking, as you know, whether you have an aura ring or not, you're, you're tracking stuff over time, right? You want to know how much deep sleep you got, um, which is also important for hair, by the way. But we do measurements physically on the scalp as well. Um, and this is a cross-sectional bundle measurement, which could be could track over time in 90-day intervals. And this is an example of how your measurements might change after a treatment, like a, a regenerative medicine therapy, like PRP or PDO. Um, this is what I have at the booth today. So I have the first AI microscope called Hair Metrics. It's artificial intelligent powered. It literally counts all the hairs in the zone and it gives us a score whether those hair fibers are thick, thin, weak, or even weaker. And it tells us exactly what's in each zone and it compares them. So we can get not only a comparison of hair caliber and hair density, but we can track that over time. Not just looking at different zones, but looking to see how you improve or not from various therapies. And so I love all of this data. It really helps us dial in as to what your treatment regimen is doing over time. So visit the booth if you want that today or tomorrow. Um, key steps, treatment strategies. What's in the toolbox? 
reducing, reducing triggers and risk factors, right? So I mentioned a few before, if you're on hormone replacement therapy, you have a stressful lifestyle, you're not adequately nourished, you have some medical conditions, you're taking medication like a statin drug or a blood pressure medication, all of these things like lifestyle and stress are gonna impact the function of the follicle and we wanna to start to attack that first. If we can reduce the risk factors, then when we start to push on the follicle, we can really get some better hair growth going on. So we always talk about that first. So it's a very holistic approach that we're taking. And then decreasing those androgen effects, especially in men and in some women, we can affect those androgens pharmaceutically, nutraceutically, and so forth. Improving hair follicle function, this is where the lion's share of stuff goes into a program, right? So you can see the list of different things, medications and supplements, phototherapy like the laser, regenerative medicine like PRP, PDO, cell therapy, stem cell treatments and such. But if the follicle's dead and gone, like some of this patient right here, or even this one right here, you're gonna need to do some degree of transplantation to get the job done. Moving a permanent follicle from the sides and the back of the scalp into the thinning zone is what we do. Future therapy, hair cloning, gene therapy, None of that is ready for prime time, but a couple of my friends are working on a lot of that cool technology, and maybe we'll have that in the future. If you think that you maybe need to bank some of your hair follicle stem cells, there's a company in the UK that can do that for you. More depth and detail on some newer therapies. I'll just point out some highlights. So I would say uh, peptide therapy is kind of a new modality. Anybody using peptides for anti-aging? Yeah, so you may have heard of uh, copper peptide. We've used that for wound healing and transplants for over 20 years. And it's a, you know, it could be a nice anti-graying anti effect as well on the scalp and zinc thymulin and a few others. A um, Couple of other interesting ones here. We do uh, prostaglandin analogs, which you may have heard of uh, in terms of the FDA approval for Latisse, which is an eyelash growth medication. We know that can also work. Those similar kinds of analogs can work on the scalp. Um, and uh, PDO Grow is kind of like a PRP 2.0. It's like a newer um, version of the regenerative medicine. Photobiomodulation, I'm a huge fan of red light therapy. You, gosh, you guys, I don't have to tell you guys about red light. It's everywhere, <laughs> everywhere in biohacking. Well, 20 years ago when I got my first laser that they told me was gonna grow hair, well, after I told them that I didn't believe it, the second thing I told them is I don't know how it works. And we didn't um, know how it worked. And it wasn't until we started treating patients did we actually see it work. But today, a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Hamblin, has published like thousands and thousands of studies on exactly what the mechanism of red light converting into cellular metabolism actually does and how that works. So this is a summary of his two decades of work in that topic. It's pretty interesting, and obviously that includes the mitochondria, which is the reason why everybody's looking to improve our energy centers and metabolism and improve mitophagy and all that business. So um, pretty incredible way to trigger those ancient um, uh, hitchhikers, if you will, those mitochondria that are sitting in us. I don't know, we have like a quadrillion of them or something, so why not get them to help us out? This is the turbo laser cap. This is the latest, greatest, top of the line, best in class laser light device for your hair and scalp health. It is not a consumer device. You need to visit a physician for this device. It is a vast improvement over the previously released laser cap type Chinese knockoffs that you see on Amazon. This is not a $600 to $800 device. Just so you know, this is a $5,200 device, but it's a five minute treatment time. It packs a punch when it comes to hair regrowth. It is non-chemical, it is non-invasive, it has absolutely no side effects. It is portable, like packs completely flat. Don't try that with your, with your capillus cap. And it has very, very high power output, 300 diodes, but it will never hurt you, it will never burn you. You cannot do any harm with this device. And it is hopefully the last device you'll ever purchase for hair regrowth for the scalp because it has a lifetime warranty. Um, Dave likes it. Pharmaceuticals. Anybody heard of finasteride or old Propecia? Yeah, so uh, finasteride is an oral anti-androgen. It blocks the formation of DHT in the body and it does it pretty well. Here's a really clever study that was done by Merck. You know, here, these, one, these patients are on the 
the, the drug, and these ones are on placebo. And then what they did after a year is they took a bunch of the drug patients and put them on placebo, and then they took a bunch of placebo patients and put them on drugs. So you get this double-blind randomized crossover clinical trial, which was indisputable in terms of hair regrowth. This is one of my poster boys for finasteride. His friends think he had a hair transplant. I assure you, he did not. Um, 10 months of regrowth. What really made him a spectacular responder to the treatment is that we caught his hair loss early. And if you look under the microscope here at this area of concern, there is a ton of weak hair. Now it's not given him much coverage here or even here. This is the same, same photo, same day. But those weaker hairs got thicker and stronger and better by diminishing the DHT in the scalp, um, in the body and certainly in the scalp. So um, minoxidil. Minoc oh, so just to finish off on the, uh, on the finasteride, finasteride does have a small chance of systemic side effects. You can have decreased libido or mild erectile dysfunction from finasteride. About 2% of patients have that. You can take them off the drug. We can change the timing of the dose. We can replace it with a topical version. That's another thing that we can do. Minoxidil was the first, it was the OG of hair regrowth. It was the first FDA approved medication. It basically eliminated all of the snake oil that was going on in the 70s at the time because it was the first drug to get FDA clearance, FDA approval for hair regrowth. And you can see the dose dependent response here. This is a 5%, this is a 2% and how it works over time. What happened at 96 weeks is they stopped the drug and you can see what happens goes down. So you got to stay on it forever, and that's the truth with any other medication or treatment if you have a chronic and progressive condition like hair loss. Uh, what's old? So the old greasy, gooey Rogaine that you get over the counter that irritated a lot of patients is not what we recommend. Um, what we do recommend is something that's a little bit more quality compounded. This is 82M. This is a tretinoin minoxidil compound uh, that also has a mild anti-inflammatory component as well, which Remember, inflammation is another component of hair loss. So it's a very powerful medication. It's our most popular topical in the practice. We've used it for almost 20 years. And it's very well tolerated. It doesn't mess up your hair, <laughs> which is good, because that certainly gets, uh, gets you knocked out of a treatment plan immediately if your hair looks, if your hair looks greasy or gooey. Um, 30 drops twice a day. Side effects like skin irritation, very rare. Nice treatment modality. Here's some results from that therapy. Um, this gentleman actually was one of the, is the only patient in the history of the practice, and I've done over 10,000 surgeries and treated over 30,000 patients. He's the only one who ever canceled his surgery on the day of the surgery after flying in to get a hair transplant. So um, we sent him home. He didn't want to be on finasteride. Uh, he had been on it and he had some side effects. So we gave him the 82M. And I figure I'm not going to ever see this guy again. I get a call about six months later and he says, oh, the hair is growing. I'm like, what do you mean? We didn't do a transplant on you. He's like, no, no, no from the topical. And P.S., I'm ready for the transplant. So this was his before photo on his second try of getting a hair transplant. So, but obviously the results thus far were only from medical therapy, so it's pretty exciting. You don't usually see that kind of a photo. Um, anybody who heard that minoxidil Rogaine doesn't work in the temples? Well, that's only because they're not allowed to market it that way, but it does work wherever you have a follicle, so you can get some growth there. Um, and more traditional approach to the crown, obviously both men and women can get good response. Topical finasteride eliminates that systemic effect of finasteride. There's a much lower concentration in the, uh, in the serum when you use topical finasteride. So this is an antiandrogen that you can use on the scalp that also contains minoxidil. So it has both topical finasteride and minoxidil in the, in the liquid. It's uh, also available for women who are postmenopausal as well to, as part of that antiandrogen regimen. The magic happens, as you know, when you start stacking treatments. And so when you start stacking things together, like lasers and nutrition and medications, you can really start to see some magical things happen. And even in an elderly or older population, I don't say elderly anymore, just you know, because they're 65 years young, 70 years young, 68 years young, they all play Mahjong together. Um, they all came in. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you can see some incredible improvements when they stack the treatments together, and it's no surprise. Sometimes it's more subtle, like, you know, I wasn't sure if Arlene was getting a result in 90 days. I mean, you know, I'd have to take the picture to really look closely, but by the time she got to six months, it was like, holy smokes, she was growing this big bristly head of hair. Um, 
and you can't really see in the dark today, unfortunately, the, the, but this patient, uh, Cynthia, she said she had not had curls like that since she was in her teens and 20s. So it really turned the clock back on her hair big time. And this is just topicals and lasers. This is what the scalp looks like under the microscope. Uh, you can't see this result in the mirror yet at 90 days typically, but this shows you that something's going on, that there's a lot of action happening, and that's what we do in our follow-ups. So a, a quick note on nutrition and nutraceuticals. There's a lot of things that we can do now. We know that because the follicles are so highly metabolic, they are definitely responsive to your nutritional intake. And so, of course, you need protein and iron to carry oxygen in the blood and so forth. And I love biotin. I developed a whole wellness system for hair. Um, some, of those, some of that product line is, is available today. Um, more coming out before the end of the year. But then there's also these really, really good herbs like saw palmetto, which knocks out the DHT, ashwagandha for stress. We also have the uh, curcumin in the new, in this, these are all in the Nutrafol actually. Uh, ashwagandha, curcumin, saw palmetto, and these others. Probiotic is also important, was on that slide. Um, the dual spin PRP uh, treatment has been a mainstay of therapy in the practice for a long time. We've done, in over 15 years, close to 9,000 PRP treatments. We know now how PRP works. It basically stops uh, cell death and increases survival, and this is the pathway. If someone says, well, I don't know if that works, well, you show them this. And then it's a lunchtime type treatment, painless. It shouldn't have any pain whatsoever during a PRP treatment. If you've had a PRP treatment and it hurt you, that means that they didn't know what they were doing. Because a PRP treatment on the scalp can be 100% painless. But most physicians don't know how to do it. They're unfortunately not taught that part of it from their reps who sold them the kit. So if your physician wants to know how to do PRP, then he should take a class like BaumanPRPClass.com. But um, we, we teach a, a class on this to make the scalp completely numb before we do the PRP. What's amazing is how many patients come back because the PRP was totally comfortable. Anyway, most important thing about PRP that you need to know is that you need the right number of platelets. This is what we learned, over 9,000 treatments. And I learned it early, but I didn't know it when I first started. These are studies that were from the world of orthopedics that show a dose-dependent response in the body and in the, in the cells from uh, platelet concentration. So there's an increase in uh, platelet fun increase in the proliferation of stem cells that related to dose, and there's a sweet spot in new blood vessel formation, and that is at 1.5 million platelets per microliter. So that's what we're trying to get to when we do PRP in the office. 1.5 million platelets per microliter. This is my $50,000 dorm fridge, which tells us how many platelets are in there. Um, this is before we started. This is your whole blood. This is what you came in with, 250,000. We spin, we do our techno wizardry, and we get to 7.5 cc's of 1.56 million platelets per microliter. And so we know we're on the right track to get you a good result. Results. If your PRP result didn't look like this, then maybe you didn't have a dual spin, and maybe you didn't have uh, 1.5 million platelets per microliter. These, all, these results also last for about a year, 10 to 14 months with a single treatment. Also works in women. And these are not simple cases. Dark hair, light skin shows a lot of skin. So these are difficult cases to get good results. Um, PDO threads is kind of like that 2.0 version of PRP. It's the placement of these threads in under the skin. And what happens is that those threads are absorbed over time. You don't walk out with these pink things, obviously. They come out before the end of the procedure. But it can be all done during the treatment time. And you get improvements in hair regrowth that happen in the same timeline as PRP, but about 20 to 50 percent stronger and 20 to 50 percent longer. So it's just an upgrade. Um, a little word on exosomes. You guys have ever used or heard of exosome therapy? Oh, a few, yeah, because it's cool. It's like stem cell therapy without the cells, right? It's the messages that the stem cells provide to the body, and now they're curated, created, and bioengineered in a laboratory, and they send it to me in a little vial that's frozen in a cryo fridge, and we use it into the scalp. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the science on that, but a lot of my colleagues and I think that it's the next big thing in hair regrowth. So that should be pretty interesting. Let's keep an eye on the, uh, the bunch of different types of exosomes that are out there. These are just from bone marrow derived ones. Um, and now I'm going to run through a little bit about hair transplants before we get a chance to finish off. So it's not pluggy or painful anymore. There's no linear scar. We do this procedure with minimally invasive techniques. So this is 24 hours out from the procedure. And this is what it looks like a week later. 
You can't tell that I've taken about 2,000 grafts or somewhere near 5,000 hairs out from that area. Um, a week later, you, or even two weeks later, you can get a nice haircut that looks good. But this is where the action happens. We put the follicles in the front or the crown, wherever you might need it, and we get nice and good, beautiful hair growth. Um, this is what it looks like up under the microscope as we're taking them out. We don't have to shave your head to do the procedure. This was a wound healing study, but you can see there's artistry in the design and the shape of the hairline and work in the temporal point. All of this stuff is important. Uh, we can also use this technique for body hair transplantation uh, if we want. These are what follicles look like under the microscope. So this is a graft, right? This is the stubble of hair, and these are the follicles underneath. And this is what gets placed into the scalp. Here's a big chunk of them, right? There's about a big pile of them there. And these are sorted in ones, twos, threes, and fours. We also have a robot that helps me do it. This is my team taking the grafts off the field, counting and sorting them, storing them under cold storage, and then implanting them into the scalp. Again, the natural shape to the hairline, angle and orientation to make it look nice and normal, doesn't look funky. And remember I said quality of life, a lot of what happens with hair is not just up here, but also right here. <laughs> Framing the face appropriately so that you get a youthful appearance, that's the critical step um, at whatever age. So the progression, six months, 12 months, Female patients with a significant amount of loss can do well with transplants. Eyelashes, eyebrows, female hairlines, sideburns in men. You can do Elvis or something a little bit more dainty. <laughs> yeah, female hairline work. Uh, she had some surgery. We covered the scar. We re restored the hairline. This is after a plastic surgery procedure. And this is my dad after his 8,000 grafts. So um, you can see his before and afters on the website and more about his story. Uh, it took a few sessions to get this kind of a result, but even if you're severely depleted of hair, there is hope, there is help, we can do it. Um, Dave Asprey's procedure, we did uh, over 4,000 grafts over two days for him which, to address the crown area as well as the hairline zone. And uh, it was a pretty fun and exciting thing to do. Obviously, he was pretty, com pretty comfortable there, at least at that moment. Um, you can see him smiling in the video, which if you want to check it out. Um, here was the hairline shape and design that he wanted. We worked for like an hour because he kept wanting it lower, lower, and lower, and lower, you know. But this is the crusting that you see for about a week or so. Normally for about, you know, could be up to two weeks. He healed in like five days flat. I mean, he was healed in like half the time. And he started growing at six weeks instead of 12 weeks. So pretty amazing biology that that guy has. It's unreal. Um, I'm not going to play the video f for you, I don't think. Oh, yes, we can. You have, you have audio? Can you make it a little bit louder? Can we play the video? Make it louder? What happens in a consultation is you've had your hair measured. So we've done the hair measurements. That tells us exactly what's going on at the level of the scalp in the most permanent zones. And the hair is there to Can't hear it. Okay. okay. Never mind. And if you want to see the uh, the video, it's but the first thing we typically talk about. I can hear some of it. That's okay. I'll skip over it. Um, if you do want to see his video, um, it's on YouTube and Vimeo and on the website. So uh, as we finish off, what's the future hold for uh, hair therapies, stem cells, treatments, specifically for, um, for balding patterns? Well, I'd like to introduce you to Nico, the nude mouse. And so he's from Japan. And uh, he's pretty stoked right now because he's got a whole crop of brand new uh, human, hair follicles, human hair follicles derived from stem cells transplanted uh, into the side and the back of his neck, I guess. He's the envy of all the nude mice in the laboratory. He's had a huge increase in self-esteem, but it just tells you exactly what's going on. <laughs> you know, so not quite ready for prime time yet for humans, but on this side of the pond, we have my friend Alexei Terskik. He's a uh, Russian researcher, actually, uh, son of a Russian researcher who's here in this country working on induced pluripotential stem cells. So it's essentially a workaround to create an unlimited supply of hair follicles. And he was able to get these newly derived potentially unlimited supply of follicles to grow through the skin on a mouse and now he's got about a huge investment from a few different companies, about $15 million to translate this into pigs. And so unfortunately pigs, uh, with few exceptions, are not like humans, I think, or is it the other way around? But anyway, uh, stay tuned, we'll see how that works. <laughs>
Um, if you would like more information about what we do and how we do it, if you have a loved one or a friend or a family member or even yourself, you can take a picture of this and you can ask me a question or you can just go to baumanmedical.com and request a consultation. We can talk about what your situation is virtually. We can talk about it uh, in the office in Boca Raton if you're in town and uh, or if you'd like to come by the booth, we'd love to scan your, your hair and count it and so forth. So uh, thank you so much for your attention today. I will take any questions that you may have if we have time. If you're too shy to ask a question, then you can scan this to ask a question. Yes, we have a question. Do you have a mic? Do we have a mic? Just speak loud so I can. Hi, Evie. Thanks so much for the great presentation. Thanks, Evie. Sure. So this is where genetics plays a very, very important role. And even though I skip quickly through the um, scarring types of alopecia, this is very, very important for African Amer those of African American descent. So if you have African hair, you are more likely to have these scarring alopecias. So if, for example, you have some thinning in the crown area, um, that needs to be examined very closely because you could have permanent damage permanent hair loss in those zones. Uh, basically, the follicle is irreversibly damaged. And a, a condition like CCCA, and maybe you've heard of that, is very common in our African-American population that seeks treatment. The other thing is uh, tight braids, wigs and weaves, basically can destroy the frontal area. So not just could you be potentially susceptible to androgenetic or female pattern hair loss, but then you put on top of that the mechanical traction and the attachment that's very common in social upbringing in your ethnicity. And so we have to look at that. I didn't include the PRP results from traction alopecia today, but if you go on the website, you can see it's pretty dramatic as long as we have a hair follicle there that we can improve upon. So that's why an evaluation, a microscopic assessment is important. And even sometimes we do biopsies to figure out what is going on at the level of the scalp. So I hope that was helpful. Yes. So the, the FDA approved dosing strategy and all the, the numbers that were all shown in those original clinical trials was about a milligram. So we usually use one to 1.25 initially. Some patients who were on treatment before the FDA approval were actually on five milligrams, which was the original FDA approval for prostate enlargement. So the question is, is what do you need? And is finasteride the right treatment for whomever, man, woman. So some of that is d evaluated and, um, and elucidated through a consultation. Sometimes we need a clinic, uh, sometimes we need the trichogenetic testing, the trico test to figure that out. You, if, for example, there's two pathways to uh, DHT, right? There's type one, five alpha reductase and type two. Type two is usually the more prominent one. That's what we're blocking with finasteride. But if you have a highly active type 1, you might need dutasteride, either topically or orally, to get a better effect. So we can adjust the dose and track you, hack and track, right, over time to see what you or someone that you know might be um, having uh, results from, you know, from those treatments. So.